Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 212, Allies in Fun, our favorite cooperative board games. I'm Sean, and here with me live, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. Remember, we record live Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, and it would be great if you joined us here in our lobby. So tonight, we've got someone trying to decide what cooperative board game to buy next. So after providing some game suggestions for them, we're going to move on to three reviews. First up, Trick Draw, a fast-flipping card game, then Outsmarted, a modern take on trivia board games, and finally, The Orbital Box Times 2. This is a puzzle box that you have to build yourself. We wrap up with our usual week in review with my first holiday hijinks experience, our first play of Orum, and more. You can always find links to games and other appropriate things we mention throughout our show notes, which you can find at tabletopbellhop.com slash episode 212. Now let's start things going with a trip to the suggestion box. Welcome to this week's suggestion box. Here we share some feedback and other comments we've gotten on our content recently. First, a comment on our Castellans of Valeria preview. Peter Schott writes, appreciate the overview, and hopefully DMG will take some of that feedback into account and get some decent player aids for some of those points, especially iconography. They've been pretty good about that in the past, but I know people can tend to ignore that when they aren't aware of it or it's just too hidden. Man, even knowing that a bit of information is available, but not being able to find it is frustrating. I know I've spent time flipping through rule books, trying to find some bit I skimmed through at one point, but only mentioned in a paragraph mid-book. Oh, so many times flipping through books going, I know it's in here somewhere. Thank you very much for the comment, Peter. I do have some good news here. Now, I know for a fact that one of the big changes made Two Castellans of Valeria from when we had the preview prototype copy is that there is now just going to be a single cohesive rule book. That way, at least everything's in one place. You're not having the what book was it in problem that we had with the original. Now, I also know that there were player aids. We actually got paper versions. We were sent PDFs. Now, these are going to be in the game in some form. Now, I don't know what that is, if it's going to be separate player sheets or just something on the back of the rule book, but there will be some form of reference. There is going to be some way. Now, the other thing I do know, too, is they are changing the look of the monuments. So they stand out better from the other pieces in the game because you can build your normal buildings in the game. But then there's monuments. And the reason monuments need to stick out is because they score every round and they are doing a couple. They had a couple different theories on what they're going to do. And I don't know what the final answer was, but one of the theories was to have them being white with the player colors on them instead of wood color with or sorry, black with the player colors. And I got to say, so far, it's been really awesome how communicative Daily Magic Games has been in regards to this game. And they've actually like kept me in the loop in regards to changes happening. Usually we do a review or a preview. Um, we get a little bit of back and forth, pass some links back and forth. But once it's live, I never hear from them again. It's not often I hear from a company a month after our previews live saying, hey, we changed this. So props to Daily Magic Games for that. Well, next we have a comment from Tolkien Fan Forever on our Horizon Zero Dawn review. I backed this game on Kickstarter and got several expansions, but did not go all in. So I lack hunts for Stormbirds, Thunderjaws, and several of the other big machines. Thanks for sharing your thoughts. Oh, you're welcome, Tolkien Fan. Now that I've got the game and I've played it, I do have some feelings of regret for uh, not having backed this game. Uh, that we were calling this Yemo on Twitter the other day. It's a, yep, I missed out. I kind of wish I had backed that one. I had FOMO when it was going on, but now I did miss out. The thing is, though, based on what I've seen, you made the right choice with which expansions you chose. Because it's the non-machine, not just a new hunt expansions that really look like they add to the game, giving you new characters, new tiles, new encounters, and things like that. You're getting so much more than just one or two new minis and one maybe one new board and a new hunt. I think it's really cool. Now, I am personally thinking of picking those up. I, I'm looking at particular. Oh, I can't remember the name of it. I think it's something of the Nora is the one that I, I think I'm leaning the most towards because it looks like it adds the most to the game. And yeah, it's cool. Now I've got snap jaws or whatever. But to me, that's not nearly as cool as having more character options and more different types of encounters. Very fair. 
And Tolkien Fan also joined us in our Discord, Discord, where you too could have a conversation directly with us. Join up at discord.tabletopbellhop.com. Now, next up, we have a comment from Beth Jackson on our Once Upon a Line preview. Beth says, oh, cool. This reminds me of those scratch card games from when I was a kid, but like super elevated, of course. Well, thanks for that, Beth. Uh, personally, what it reminded me of, and I don't know if anyone else grew up with these, if they're a Southwestern Ontario thing, though I think it would, we mainly got them when we were in the States, actually driving to bowling tournaments with my parents, were invisible ink games that you could basically get at any truck stop where we would pull over and we would, you know, everyone used the washroom and there'd be my dad would get some coffee and my parents would be this round like display of all these different books with these yellow markers on them. And they like the end of the marker looked yellow. But then when you drew inside the book, it would show up black text and it was like invisible ink. I think they were called invisible ink books. And I think that's what once upon a line remind me of. But of course, it's more based on scratch tickets. And I got to say, I still think it's a really cool concept. And I am looking forward to people who back the Kickstarter once they get the final product, because we only got to see such a small portion of the game. I'm curious to hear what people's thoughts are on the full experience. Well, let's wrap up with some comments on our topic of games you keep in your collection, even if you don't love them yourself. First, we have Nate Parker, who wrote, Journalist falls into this category for me. I am sure I have several others, but can't think of them presently. Then we have Keith J. Davies, who commented, I keep Splendor and Carcassonne, as they are good introductory casual games. Mm -hmm. Star Realms is pretty decent, but I think Hero Realms did it better but I have heard the revised Star Realms is better yet. <laughs> Dominion, I can take or leave. Catan, I'd much rather leave. I will use it as a gateway. And finally, Richard noted, none. I only have room for stuff I enjoy. Well, thanks all of you for the comments. Uh, I was pleased to see how many people are just like me and keep games because other people they game with enjoy them. Though sometimes I wish I was more like Richard and only kept the games I personally want to play the most rearranging my gaming space to be able to record down here today and finding space for what was up here was quite a bit of a pain. And maybe if I only kept the games I personally love, I might've had enough room. Well, I think that's good for tonight. Remember, even if you don't, if we don't read your comment, reply or message out loud, we do appreciate hearing from you. All right. One reminder before we get to our main topic. A reminder that we will not be recording a live show next week. That's right. Next Wednesday, that's July the 12th, is right in the middle of the annual Amazon Prime Day sale. And Deanna and I are going to be very busy. We encourage you, all of you in the S or somewhere with reasonable shipping from the U.S., to pay attention to our various tabletop gaming deal accounts and the Tabletop Bellhop website. Twitter fans should be aware that with the current state of the site, it may not be the best spot to catch deals. Now, we will be sharing deals in the Good Geek Deals group on Facebook, at Tabletop underscore deals on Twitter, at Tabletop Gaming Deals one word on Dice Camp, in the Tabletop Gaming Deals group on MeWe, on our newly created R Tabletop Gaming Deals on Reddit, and honestly, our uh, landing page at Tabletop Bellhop is live now. So if you go to Tabletop Bellhop, even right now, we do have a landing page already live for Prime Day with a little bit of tips and tricks for Prime Day, how to sign up for Prime Day if you don't have, or sorry, Prime, how to sign up for Prime if you don't have it yet, as well as some early deals. Happy deal shopping. We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight's question comes from Amon Jerome Lamy, who reached out on Facebook looking for some help. They wrote, I'm obsessed with co-op games. I own Zombicide Black Plague and its expansions, and also Pandemic and the Cure expansion. I'm looking at getting some new ones for us to try. My brother has agree agreed to buy Arkham Horror the card game for us, but I want to get something myself. I'm looking into 11 different games and wondering <laughs> if you have played them all and if you could rank them for me. They then provide a list of 11 games, which we'll get to in a bit. So first off, thanks for the great question, Amon. Now, when I saw this, I was immediately struck by the fact that we have talked about cooperative games quite a bit. But every single time we've talked about them, it's been kids games. So we have an entire show on cooperative kids games. Link will be in the show notes. And we have another one that's like great cooperative kids games that adults will find fun, which, yes, that's two different lists. There is some overlap. 
but we've never actually talked about the cooperative games we like. Now, yes, some of these have come up on other game recommendation lists, but we've never had a cooperative adult game list. I don't want to say adult, a hobby game list, whatever. We've never shared our own personal uh, favorite cooperative games. So what I'm going to do tonight is we are going to answer Amon's questions. I'm going to I'm going to rank the the 11 games they listed, but I want to then expand this to be a talk about our favorite cooperative games out of all the ones we played. Well, before that though, let's give Amon what they asked for. Here is his a list list of 11 games in our order of preference. Now, I will say I have not played all 11. So the bottom 3 games I haven't had the pleasure of playing so I can't rank them. So the three at the bottom of the list, only because I haven't played them, are Too Many Bones, Besieged, and Spirit Island. Now, of the three, based on the research I've done, podcasts I've wa- I've listened to, videos I've watched, the one that looks the best of those three would be Spirit Island. And I have a feeling if I own Spirit Island, it would have been on our list tonight. And uh, we're not going to rank our list later, but I think it would have been pretty high up had I ranked it. Next would be Too Many Bones which looks fascinating. We stopped by the Chip Theory Games booth at Origins, and I, I again got to touch it. Those neoprene pads and those custom dice look awesome. But I sat through, I was at an event where at Extra Life where a local group played through a game, and it took them way too long. So that one, I, I'm, I'm not as sure on. And then there's Besieged. Besieged, I know very little about. I know it was a big mini heavy. I think it's a cool mini or not game. But again, I have not played that one whatsoever. So that's this again, these three. Not based on personal experience, just what I've seen online. Next up, I have Forbidden Desert. Now, my kids dig this series of games, but for whatever reason, they just never sat well for me. I don't know why. Then is Aeon's End. Now, I dig Aeon's End. It's fun, and I absolutely love the fact it's a deck builder with a neat thing where you never shuffle your deck. You... When your cards go in your discard, you just flip that discard pile over so you can really set up your future turns. But that was about it. Like, that was neat, and I never really got all that into the rest of the game. The the cooperative aspects of it, the opening the portals just didn't do it for me. Moving up the list, I would go with mechs versus minions. Now, this is still fairly low on the list because we started it, and I never finished it. I love program movement games, and this is a cool one, but obviously it just didn't quite sync with our group as well as I'd hope so. So next so that one I, I do recommend, but it's still kind of in the middle of the list. Next for us would be Cthulhu Death May Die, a very different take on Mythos games, uh, much more two-fisted, dice-rolling fun than others you'll find in that uh, Cthulhu Mythos genre. Now, speaking of the Mythos genre, my next one would be Mansions of Madness. This is honestly one of the best app-driven games I've played. That is, it's a really well done Mythos game, great cooperative game, very atmospheric. Next up, though, what I enjoy even more is Mage Knight. I adore this game, though honestly, it can play better solo and can really bog down with more than two players. But this tops the others I've already mentioned. Then we have Gloomhaven, which would be my number one recommendation, except for Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. Jaws is such a great way to enter the Gloomhaven world that we just can't recommend any groups not starting with that cheaper, smaller box uh, to onboard them to the game and, uh, you know, just to make sure it's to their taste so that they're not going to waste any money on the big, expensive game Mm -hmm. that they may or may not enjoy. And from what we can tell, it is still true or perhaps Mm -hmm. even more true with the upcoming release of Gloomhaven Second Ed. Go in on Jaws of the Lion now and learn before you buy that or Frosthaven or any of the other. So there you go, Amon. I hope that helps. But I also hope you stick around and listen to the full episode because now we're going to get into some cooperative games we've enjoyed, which includes games that weren't on your list. Now, unlike that last list, which was ranked, these games we're about to suggest are in no particular order. Now, we're gonna, I'm going to start off with DC deck building card game. Now there are both cooperative, uh, competitive and uh, competitive versions to play of this game. But generally speaking, you are cooperating to defeat the forces of evil. Uh, And with such a wide range of cards, there's another version on Kickstarter right now, just after my big box delivered. 
Uh, you know, if you are a fan of DC at all, there is something in the DC deck building universe for you to enjoy uh, cooperatively. Now, next is the one overlip, uh, overlap, sorry, one overlap um, to what we just recommended to Amon, and that is Gloomhaven starting with Jaws of the Lion. I think Sean covered it well, so we're all good there. Start with Jaws, move on to the rest of the Gloomhaven games if you find yourself enjoying it. Next up, we have Horrified. Now, this is one we haven't talked about in a while, but <laughs> is still, if you enjoy that monster genre, the hor- the, the old monsters, uh, Monsters of Hollywood, a fantastic cooperative game with a really nice way to uh, vary the difficulty with the number of monsters present in the game. Now, it isn't going to be one of the more difficult games on the list, but it is a fun Easy, relatively easy game for a wide range of ages and again difficulties with that monster n- a number of monsters variability and since that one came out there is also the cryptid based horrified american monsters if you're not interested in the old universal style Pretty true uh next i have code names duet which i don't know how many times i'm going to preach this i don't know if i'm actually preaching to the choir or if i've had any converts yet but to me it is the better version of co- code names Despite the name duet does not necessarily mean it is a two-player game, though I hate the fact they called it that because everyone assumes it is. This is a cooperative version of Codenames where you are working in teams trying to get the opposing team to guess the words you see while they're trying to get you to guess the words they see, and there's some overlap. It is is by far, in my opinion, the better version of Codenames out there. Next up, we have Hanabi. This is an interesting one because it's just basically a card game. The big difference being your cards are being seen by everyone else and not you. (laughs) Players have a limited uh, vocabulary of clues to give and no uh, uh, rules are you cannot talk about anything just following the very limited set of color or shape uh, or color or number uh, clues available to you to try and get everyone to lay out the cards in order it's incredibly hard it's incredibly fun uh and if you like or and are and are willing to play limited uh communication games this one should probably be on your list next i have chronicles of crime i probably recommend the entire series but i specifically for this list put on 1400 um being a fantasy role play fan i like the aspect of playing in Uh, Medieval times much more interesting to me than solving modern crimes and sticking with the fantasy theme in this particular one. You as an investigator do get um, prophetic dreams as part of the experience. The most amazing part about Chronicles of Crime is it is an app driven game that has some really cool immersion. If you want to talk to a specific um, witness, you just scan a QR code on them. If you wish to combine an item with something or a place, you just scan the two QR codes. Added to that, there are even AR aspects where you get to a place and scan it and get to use your phone in AR and look around a crime scene. And that was just so immersive and cool. Uh, They even offer like a full Oculus Rift like piece of cardboard thing that you can put on to, to improve it. I just stood there with my phone. So next recommendation for me is the Chronicles of Crime series. My personal favorite being 1400. Next up, I've got one that's new to us, but still Mm -hmm. an enjoyable game, and that is Illiterati. Illiterati is a word-based cooperative game where players are using letter tiles to uh, solve challenges given to them on cards, uh, and there's a number of challenges that need to be done. But again, it is cooperative, so you can talk about the the different um, cards you have what it is you're trying to solve you can share letters freely between each other Mm -hmm. and there is an overall goal to be reached uh not just everybody fighting for themselves a la scrabble Mm -hmm. uh and so this one is great for people who uh families who have different levels of spelling ability uh if you've got that one person in your family who is the the scrabble master and nobody ever wants to play uh, word games with them because they always win Illumi, uh, or literati is a fantastic option because that person is now helping the entire team with their vocabulary, not competing against them. And once again, that is illiterati. 
Yeah, for, for those that don't know the game, think Bananagrams where you can trade letters where you're trying to complete objectives like spell words with uh, animals and someone else is trying to spell synonyms. My next one is Legendary Encounters Alien, a deck building game, I think is the full title. Deck builders like to have long titles. Um, this is the follow up to Marvel Legendary, which you will note is not on my list because technically it's not a cooperative game. The Legendary Encounters series took that and made it a full cooperative. And the Alien set does some amazing things to make you feel like you're playing through the first three Alien movies, um, including things like jump scares. There is a the way the I can't remember the name of it, but basically the Alien deck, the Encounter deck and how cards are revealed and move around on the board. You never know quite what to expect. And you actually get like the blips on the radar and everything has some great rules for cooperating where you can share symbols between players to give you that working together as a squad feel. Other legendary encounter games are just as popular um, with other people. Personally, I like the alien one best out of what I played. All right. That was legendary encounters alien. And next up is letter jam. This is another letter based cooperative game uh, that sort of takes uh, some, some aspect of literati, but also some aspects of Hanabi and puts yeah. them together into a uh, game where you can't see the letters in front of you. So uh, letters are passed out, words are made, uh, but, and then passed around to the next player who is displaying them outwards uh, away from them. Clues are given. You're, you're trying to get people to uh, guess the letters available and uh it's a fun game again you've got a lot of communication and a lot of fun uh just trying to think up of how you can possibly make make words out of the available letters uh and uh the scoring on this one is a little on the interesting side but mm -hmm. uh aside from that it is a solid uh cooperative word game that was letter jam Next is probably the easiest game on the list, and that is the game. The entire goal is you have a deck of cards that are one to one hundred, or secondly, two to ninety nine, and you shuffle them, and you just have to play those cards in order. Sounds simple, but trust me, it is not. Uh, you're using four different piles of cards to play on to two going upwards from one to ninety nine hundred, the others going down from one hundred to one, and then the one hundred and the one are what's on the board. But you have to play two cards from your hand at a time. There's limited communication in this one. You are allowed to communicate. So it's not the mind, which you will note is not on our list. Um, you can talk to each other, but it's like, oh, are you going to go too far? Are you just going to go a bit? Oh, I'm going to make a big jump or, oh, don't play there. Right. You're saying that kind of thing. This is a game when I first played it really didn't catch me. The more I play this, the more I enjoy it. This has become one of our favorite two player games that Deanna just keeps in her purse. And whenever, you know, at a restaurant, a bar or a pub, we'll break out our copy of the game. Enjoy it just as much with more players. And that was the game. Well, next up, we have The Crew, which is actually two different games. Uh, that's The Crew, The Quest for Planet Nine, and The Crew, Mission Deep Sea. Now, these are both trick-taking games, but unlike a lot, they are cooperative trick-taking games mm -hmm. uh, where you are trying to hit specific trick-taking goals that are different for every round. I know the, the quest for planet nine has 50 different mm -hmm. goals to try and work through, uh, in a, in a progressive set. Um, and so it's a uh, mission based, essentially, uh, yep. mission, mission based, uh, cooperative, uh, card game. And that is the crew, the quest for planet nine and mission deep sea. Uh, next up, I have the Exit series. Um, I didn't pick a specific game here. Now, these are single play only games, which is the one downfall to them. But every single one we played, we've enjoyed. There are a number of different escape room in a box style series out there. But the one I think we have enjoyed the most is the Exit series from Cosmos. Um, if you're looking for your first experience with one of these, I recommend the Haunted Roller Coaster. If you're looking for something a little more complicated, there are other choices. We've reviewed a few of these over at tabletopbellhop.com, which you can head over there or check YouTube for our videos to see what we thought of specific ones. No, we don't spoil anything. Now, what is fantastic about these is they work good for a group of, you know, anywhere from two to five players. Single player, you're going to have a hard time. You just, you need that multiple different people's way of thinking and way of looking at things to really enjoy these. And in particular, the exit game series is better than some of these other series by letting you 
divvy up tasks for different players. And that is the exit series from Cosmos Games. Next up, we have Roll Camera from Grand Gamers Guild. This is a fun, cooperative dice placement game where you're trying to make a film based on uh, essentially a random selection of words given to you Mm -hmm. by the game. Now, this one can be a little bit uh, quarterback-y, quarterback-y, mm-hmm. so it depends a lot on your group. But if you have a group that cooperates well and no one tends to overpower uh, the group, Roll Camera is a super fun game with just staggering amounts of replayability, especially oh, yeah. if you add the B-movie expansion. Uh, mm-hmm. You're not going to see the same movie twice. Yeah, I strongly recommend that expansion. If you can find the bundle, I don't know if it's still available... So that one is distributed by Grand Gamers Guild, but actually published by Keen Bean Studios. And I think it's Keen Bean that now has copies of it. The next one is the most unique cooperative game on this list. And I mainly included it just because it's so different from everything else. And I was looking for a wide variety of types of cooperative games. And that is Rail Pass. This is a pick up and deliver train game where you literally pick up and deliver trains by loading the trains with little wooden cubes and passing the trains to the players on your left and right, or possibly even passing them through a tunnel to the player across the table to you. The goal of the game is to get all of the colored cubes to the appropriate cities. Everyone gets a random mix of cubes in front of them and has to get the green cubes to the green city and the red cubes to the red city. But of course, trains can only hold so many and you can only hold one train in each hand and you're trying to pass them and load them and unload them while other players are going and it's real time. And come on, we got to get those trains and I just need two reds before the time runs up. Of course, you drop a train and it crashes. You spill a cube and you've lost that cargo. Plus, there's a whole system for the conductors or the, the what do you call, engineers can only go, won't go too far away from their home city. So you're having to swap engineers. There's just a ton of neat stuff going on. But I absolutely adore the fact this is a pick up and deliver game where you physically pick up and deliver components to other players. That just blows me away. And that was Rail Pass. Next up, we have one that may seem a little odd, but bear with me, folks. It's My Little Pony Adventures in Equestria deck building game. It's got a giant name, but you know what? It's got a giant bunch of content in it as well. Now, while it certainly helps if you are a fan or at least aware of My Little Pony and don't despise them, but the fact of the matter is this is not a kid's game. This is a solid deck building game with six different resources to track, a uh, variable difficulty scale. Uh, I think really the only complaint that we managed to find for this game was that some of the iconography and Mm -hmm. text is a little small for our aging eyes. But if you don't have that problem uh, and you enjoy deck building, then this game is worth checking out. Unless, of course, you absolutely despise ponies. But you don't hate ponies, do you? (laughs) That was the My Little Pony deck building game, My Little Pony Adventures in Equestria. All right, the last one on the list, fans of the show have to have guessed was coming at some point. And that is the Adventuria Adventure Card Game from our friends at Ulysses Spiel. I don't know how much more we can can proselytize this game. This is, in my experience, the the best cooperative card game out there. um, Played in the cooperative mode, not the dueling mode. Yes, Adventuria can kind of be played like magic. But even the company that makes the game has realized that's a losing perspective. Can't wait for the new revised versions coming from Kickstarter that are going to make the RPG elements more involved. You're going to actually start getting branching paths and a better level up system. But even without that, we love Aventuria. And yes, it is in print at North America. We saw physical copies for sale at Origins. It is being distributed by Studio Publish- Studio 2 Publishing. You can get this game. If you have difficulty finding it, just let me know. I'll send you a link on where you can actually get a copy of Aventuria. All right, well, that is our list. But we still, as always, have some honorable mentions that deserve a little bit of recognition on our list. So first for me is Marvel Champions, because I think this probably belongs on the list, but I haven't ever even played a non-learning game. So when you get the game, 
It gives you preset decks and it tells you to play Spider-Man. And if you want to play two player, play Captain Marvel. Well, that's all we've done. So I can't really throw it on my play this awesome cooperative game when all I've done is played the, the intro version. And I would love to play more Marvel champions, but right now there is the pile of obligation that is, is blocking the path. I have to fight through that pile before I feel justified in spending time deep diving Marvel champions, plus a ton of expansion content. Now they have not even come close to doing every Marvel hero, but there are tons of box sets out for this. So next up is uh, Scooby-Doo Escape from Haunted Mansion, uh, the best available, currently available, Coded Chronicles game. Mm-hmm. Now, the reason this one ended up on our own honorable mention list is it's really a one and done. But yeah. one of the nice things about this game, though, is even though it's done, you can pass it on to someone else and they yes. can still get the full experience. There is no destruction or tearing or writing of anything in this game. So while each game group is only really able to enjoy it once, multiple game groups can enjoy a single copy. Now, my final one is the Warhammer Quest adventure card game, which is a game that might have eventually been cooler than Adventuria. For one, it wins for being Warhammer, and I am a huge Warhammer fanboy. I didn't have any experience with the Dark Eye before playing Adventuria, so I have no, like nostalgia or fuel for the universe in adventure but i love the warhammer world i love the fact that one of the characters is a a sigmarite um champion of sigmar and then another one's a troll slayer and you have your wood elf and you have your fire mage because that's your typical warhammer party anymore nowadays and this was a great game with some great cooperative rules and neat rules where you got to do four different things but one of your things was to refresh your cards and try and decide when to rest and was extremely well done but it was just one base box. Then Fantasy Flight lost the less the license, and the game died on the vine. As far as I'm concerned, because like most Fantasy Flight starter sets, you don't you kind of only give you a taste, and that's all we got with this. Now I am fully aware that there is fan created content out there, and congratulations, fans, on keeping this game going. But you can't even get the base game anymore because it's been so out of print. All right, well, there you have our recommendations for cooperative board games for when you all want to work together and play against the game instead of each other. Did we miss your favorite game? Comment to let us know about it, or better yet, join the Tabletop Bellhop Discord at discord.tabletop slash at discord.tabletopbellhop.com. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, it was a mess. Not sure what happened there. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened there. So before we go on, I do want to call out some recommendations we are getting right now from our chat room here on Twitch. So these are some other people's favorite cooperative games that they would like. So the first one I saw was Spirit Island. Uh, Next and Minions got men- mentioned at the exact same moment you mentioned it on yes. this show. So Spirit Island was mentioned that you need to play multiple times to figure out the synergies between the gods. But that's not a bad thing. It's just a note that it's not a single use game. Yeah, Mex Mercer's Minions did come up. And then Red Meeple Ryan, longtime fan of the show, has, has a list for us here. So we have Defenders of the Realm, which I like to call Fantasy Pandemic. And we have Pandemic the Cure. Elder Sign, which is the Fantasy Flight dice-driven mythos game. The co-op mode for Conquest of Planet Earth. And then he has other co-op games with co-op modes, but he's yet to try them. All right. So thank you for the additional suggestions chat room. Do you have a question for us? As Amon did, hit us up with an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to the blog and click on Ask the Bellhop. Welcome to our review of Trick Draw, a fast-playing card game from Housefish Balloon, who we have to thank for sending us a review copy to check out. Trick Draw was designed by Blake Propach and Morteza Reinhanajad. This Western fantasy card game features artwork by Michael Kruda and Li Chang Mei and was published in late 2022 by House, Housefish Balloon LLC after a successful Kickstarter campaign. And for those people's names we just mentioned, thankfully on the YouTube video, we put their names right up in front of us. 
Yes. Now, this small box game plays two to five players super quickly. While mm-hmm. listed as being for ages 12 plus, we think younger players could pick up this game pretty easily. Yeah. It's fairly light, but it is a step above most mass market card games. Now, Trick Draw is a card driven race to 10 victory points. Each turn, you draw a card and play a card. Each card can be placed face down for one point or face up, doing its ability that's on the card. Now, many of those abilities will let you play or draw more cards, as well as flip over cards already in play. Card combos, timing, tactics, and memory are all going to play a role in Trick Draw. This is also the first game set in the Salundria universe. Now, for what a look for a look at what you get with this rapid fire Wild West shooter card game, check out our Trick Draw unboxing video on YouTube. You won't actually see everything, but we'll get to that in a minute. Now, Trick Draw comes in a cool crate-shaped box with a magnetic lid. Inside the lid is a reminder that the game is a race to 10 gold, and under that lid is a plastic insert with room for two sets of cards. Because there are two versions of this game. One that comes with one deck, which is what we're looking at, and a copy that has two decks that doubles the player count. The rule book is tall and fairly long, but the actual rules aren't all that complicated. While the text was annoyingly small, the number Mm -hmm. of examples given was appreciated. In the back of the rule book, you will find a card glued into it. Don't bother trying to remove this, as there was an error made, and it is permanently Mm -hmm. glued in there. Now, when you pick up the game, you should be getting an extra copy of this card. Now, under the instructions, you find a small box labeled Volume 2 Trick Draw. As you can see in the unboxing video, this completely baffled me. I had no idea what this was and thought maybe it was an expansion because it said Volume 2. Now, I know this contains a very silly, very simple three-card card game called House Fish Balloon, which the designer expects you to play to determine start player when playing Trick Draw. So if you do open this and you see volume two, don't be worried. Open it right away. Go for it. So that's all. So all that's left are cards. And there's a rather large stack of these. They're good quality, easy to shuffle, and feature some nice artwork. Now, while some of the cards are a bit dark, the clarity of the text on them makes up for that, as that's what's most important during the play. Now, with that, let's move to an overview of play. To win Trick Draw, you have to be the first person to 10 points. Game ends immediately at 10 points. Note that could happen on any player's turn, not necessarily the active player. The best way to start a game of Trick Draw is to play a quick game of Housefish Balloon. This is a small three-card game that comes with every copy of Trick Draw. Since this is a review of Trick Draw, we'll leave you to figure out how to play that game on your own. Don't worry, it's super easy. Now, once you know who's starting, they shuffle all the cards and deal out two cards to each player and put the deck in the middle where everyone can reach it. That's it. Probably the quickest setup of any game we've reviewed so far on the show. Each turn, the active player draws a card and then either plays a card and draws two more cards or draws two or draws two more cards. When playing, you can place a card face down or face up. Face down cards are each worth one point. Face up, the cards have abilities then players can use any uh, once per turn any abilities on their existing cards in play. The various card abilities are what makes Trick Draw work. Card abilities include discarding cards to draw more cards, playing more cards, or flipping cards over, including yours or other players, instantly drawing cards and keeping some of them, flipping cards from two different players, stealing a card and flipping it, or flipping all your cards, and more. Some of these abilities go off as soon as the card is played and every time it's flipped back over to its front and mm-hmm. others go off when you want, uh, when you want with a limit of once per turn. Now, after playing a card and activating a card abilities, play moves to the next player clockwise and the game continues and some till someone hits 10. Now, besides winning by getting 10 points, there are three special cards in the deck, the temple, the key and the treasure. Having the right combination of two of these in play at any time instantly wins the game. Now, in addition to these basic rules, there's also a variant that we like quite a bit called the shootout game mode. When playing this way, when a player hits 10 points, you keep playing. Everyone else gets one more turn. At the end of that round, anyone who's tied for points is eliminated. You shot each other. Then the player who's left standing with the most points wins. 
Now you know what you get and how to use it, so it's time for our thoughts on QuickDraw. So when I originally signed up to check out this game, I totally thought I was getting a trick-taking card game. So the first thing you need to know is that this is not a trick taper, despite the name trick draw. Now, after getting over that misunderstanding, I was pleasantly surprised by how much fun we've been having with the card game we did get, even if it wasn't what I was expecting. Admittedly, as soon as you see the box and the art, the name makes complete sense. But it's quite understandable to think that a card game called Trick Draw, without that artistic hint, would be our favorite type of trick-taking card game. Now, Trick Draw is a very solid, super fast card game with surprising depth. The mechanics really couldn't be simpler. Draw a card, play a card face up or face down, then activate cards you have. But the actual powers on the cards and how they interact make for a rather fascinating game. Now, while there's strategies you can learn and knowing which ending type you're playing makes a big difference, you learn the mechanics of the game in seconds. Mm -hmm. Draw a card, play a card, one side or the other. That's it. Yeah. Now, these simple mechanics make it a joy to teach. And I love the fact there's really no setup time to this game. This reminds me of traditional playing card games where you just shuffle the deck, deal out some starting hands and go. It's nice to have a game that doesn't have lots of bits and boards and things to set up before you can even start playing. Of course, easy to learn mechanics doesn't mean an easy game. Very true. There is a slight learning curve to Trick Draw, and I would say most players have been kind of lost their first round. It isn't until you get to see what some of the cards do and how they interact that you, for you to really understand the beauty of this game. Now, once you see the various card combos and strategies around flipping and unflipping cards, that's when the game starts to shine. So you probably won't get it on that first play. Now, I don't find this to be a problem because Trick Draw is so short. I don't mind playing a full learning game when the game only takes 15 minutes and when players are usually more than willing to try a second round immediately after finishing the first. Deck composition is really the thing you need to grasp. And while you could let people go through the deck, it's easy enough to learn as you play as long as you don't mind being a little bit uh, behind on your first play if others have played previously. Now, another aspect I like in Trick Draw is that there isn't just one way to win. It's not just about having 10 cards face down at one point each. That is one way to win. But most wins I've seen come from a combination of face down cards worth points and face up card abilities. And I've also seen a few quick wins using that Temple T treasure combo that does exist as well, though those don't come up very often. If any one strategy does seem to be better than anything else, it does feel like rally cards might be a little overpowered. But that can be countered if the other players are paying attention. If you know that there's the possibility someone could be collecting rally cards, it's up to the rest of the players to try to stop them. And that's the key, paying attention. There are a number of cues to look for as to how someone is trying to win. And of course, if you know that, you might very well be bluffing one of them and going <laughs> for another. Now, one of the best aspects of this game is despite being a card game and thus highly random, I always felt like I had agency when playing. I feel like I'm making real decisions that matter, which are impacting my chance of winning or losing. As we discussed on our podcast episode about game pacing, that's great to find in a game that plays this quickly. Now, once everyone at the table is familiar with the deck, the game couldn't be much faster. The only real pauses come as you try to remember what another player has on the other side of a card you may want to flip. Now, while Trick Dog does play okay at two players, we found it doesn't really start to shine until you've got at least three and then improve the more players you had. Now, I only have the single deck version of the game, so I didn't get to try it with six or more, but I think it's only going to get better the more players you have. I think the limiting factor at large counts will be the ability to pay attention and see those cues to know when someone is going for a certain win. Now, my only real disappointment with this game is that it wasn't a trick-taking game. And while I can't blame Housefish Balloon for that, because I'm the one that didn't do enough research, I just made the assumption a card game named Trick Draw would have tricks in it. Though I do have to say, I don't know, not having tricks in a game called Trick Draw is probably going to cause confusion for more people than me. If you saw this game on the shelf, I wouldn't be surprised if you made the same assumption I did. 
I, I don't know. In name only, I agree. But I think the art really sells the idea of a Wild West gunfight and that concept of a trick draw as opposed to a trick drawing card game. Yeah, overall, I was surprised and impressed by Trick Draw and Always. Component quality is great. Mechanics are simple and super easy to learn and teach. And the gameplay is surprisingly deep and engaging. This is a great quick playing card game that features a lot of player agency for a game that's over in 15 minutes. Now, if you are on the hunt for a new filler game, something quick and easy to play at the start of the night, or as an end cap or to fill in between longer games, I think Trick Draw is a great fit. If you mm -hmm. like to play a game after a morning cup of tea, Trick Draw makes for a great tea game. If you like to have quick to play games on hand that handle a wide range of player counts as well, Trick Draw is a good choice, especially if you pick up the two deck version that plays up to 10 players. What you aren't going to find here is a deep, thinky Euro with a ton of strategy and planning. That's just not what Trick Draw is, and you should probably give it a pass if that's all your group is into. Now, if you or your group are into fantasy western, somewhat steampunk things, this is a cool game to add to your collection. It's basically meant to be the first in a series of games set in a world house fish balloon called Salundria. It looks like the next thing they are working on is going to be a full role playing game. Based on what we're seeing here, it looks to be a cool universe, and I'm looking forward to seeing where it goes. Well, that's it for our look at Trick Draw. A super quick playing, card flipping, race to 10 points that surprised us in many ways. What's a game that surprised you by not only being not what you expected, but by being way better than you could have imagined? Mm -hmm. Tell us about it in the comments below. Now, before I go, I also want to call out that I will be publishing a written review of Trick Draw over at tabletopbellhop.com, where I'll be sharing a bunch of pictures from our plays and get into a bit more detail. So check that out when you've got time. Finally, if you did enjoy this review, please consider tipping your bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Welcome to our review of Outsmarted, a hybrid physical digital trivia game from Qplay, who we have to thank for sending us a review copy to check out. Outsmarted is a modern trivia board game published in 2020 by Qplay after a rather successful Kickstarter campaign. This roll, move, and answer a question style game lets you play with two to 24 players. So you're going to be playing in groups of up to four if you play more than six players in one sitting. The game is app driven. It can be played with everyone sitting around the same table or through remote play. Game time ranges depending on the game mode you choose and can be as short as half an hour. Mm -hmm. The box says the game is for ages eight plus and we don't see anything wrong with that. Now, Outsmart is going to feel very familiar to anyone who's played popular trivia games going back to the 80s. You roll, move, and then answer a question based on what color you landed on. The thing is, Outsmart modernizes the classic trivia game experience from this point on. Well, that part's going to feel the same. You are going to play different ways. Like, you can complete and, and try to do the collect things in each color. So answer a primary question in each color and collect things. In this case, it's rings. Or you can play for points, which is a great change. You can play a full game with a bonus lightning round, or you can play a timed game with, as Sean mentioned, short as half an hour if you want to play nice and quick game. In all the modes, though, it is the players that get to pick the categories, and players are going to get questions tailored to their age group. Now, there are other improvements as well, which we'll get into in a bit. First off, a note about the components. Outsmarted comes with a fairly large four-panel board, one oversized D6, and a set of great-looking pawns that feature a diverse group of historical figures. Now, to use all this, you also need the free Outsmarted app. Now, this is available on pretty much all devices. You've got Android, iOS, and Steam. A copy of the game includes one license that you can use on up to three devices. No, only the owner of the game needs a key. You don't need a key to be able to just play the game. Now, there is a set of rules in the box, but they aren't great. They are in a number of languages, and I don't think English was the original. Most of the book just covers how to get the app and set it up. Now, my only real complaint regards the components is that the colors on the board could have been a little more clear and differentiated. The red and orange colors in particular are very similar, and they're actually slightly different than the colors used in the app. 
even people without any color-based vision issues may have a hard time with these. And it kind of baffles me because this could have been easily fixed by including some symbology on the squares, but instead every square has the same Q logo on it instead of a way to differentiate the different ones. Uh, personally, depending on the light, I have I have had numerous issues looking or to, trying to tell the difference between the red and the orange. Uh, yeah. and, and you need to look at the board to double check the comparison between the two colors to know which one you're actually dealing with. Yeah. But now, what you, but now you know what you get in the box and you've grabbed the app. Let's get into how to actually play Outsmart It. So you start with the app. You set up the kind of game you want to play through a bunch of options you get to select from. Like you can do an individual or a team game. The game length, which could be a full game, and that ends once one player collects all six rings and completes the bonus round. Or you can play a timed game, and the preset times are 30, 60, or 90 minutes. Then select if you want to play for rings or points. In point mode, the first question you are asked is, is worth 100 points. For each correct answer in a row, the points you earn goes up by 100 points. All the ring questions start at 500 points. Now, there's also some options to speed up the game. You can reduce the amount of animations, and you can do a quicker version of the final round. Now, once you've decided on what type of game you want to play, you need to set up each of the players by giving them a name and age range. You only have to do this once for each player, as the next time you play, they'll already be listed in the app. Now, by creating individual player like accounts in the app, it's kind of cool because you're going to get neat things like your overall accuracy, your win rate, and your high scores being tracked between games. Now, once everyone is in the app, you're then going to select which players are actually playing this game and pick which playing piece each will use. Anyone playing remotely or choosing to use the app at the table will now have to select which character they are playing on their own device. While the game can be played with just one device at the table, we strongly suggest that every player brings the game on their own. Next is picking the six categories to use for this game. Now, there are a wide variety of categories that come with the base game, plus there's the option to purchase even more categories as in-app purchases. Now, before you want to rush away and do that, make sure you check your email because I am getting a surprising amount of emails from QPlay sending out uh, offering discounts or even free categories for various holidays and such. Like right now, they have a 4th of July sale. Now, this is just a small selection of the categories we personally try to. Pub quiz, act to school, sound and music, entertainment, Halloween, 80s hits, man's best friend, vintage cartoons, the logo quiz, and where on earth? Now, when we play, we lead, let each player pick a category to make it as fair as possible for everyone at the table. When playing with less than six, we let some players pick twice or include a generic trivia categories like pub quiz. Now, with six categories chosen, you're ready to go. Everyone places their pawn on the starting spot in the middle of the board. The app shows you whose turn it is. Each turn, the active player rolls the die and moves their pawn on the board. They then answer a question based on which color they land on, selecting the appropriate category in the app. The question is presented on the app and the player picks between four options. To get the correct answer, they score points if you're playing for points, and then get to go again. Now, along with the basic squares, there are also six ring spaces. These have to be landed on by an exact roll, but there are re-roll spots on the board close to each of these to make them easier to hit. These present harder questions which earn extra points and a ring when answered. As a nice touch, once you land on a ring, you stay there until you get a question right. Now, when answering questions, you also have three assists you can use. There's a 50-50 that eliminates two possible answers, a 30-second timer increase, or the ability to skip a question entirely. Now, sometimes, after you've rolled, moved, and you select a category, you'll get some kind of random bonus reward. You'll spin a wheel on the app or pull a lever or open a, a safe and get a bonus. These include additional assists or a score multiplier for the question you're about to answer. You do never get a phone a friend assist, however. No, <laughs> no, you now, do not. When you get a question wrong, you lose 50 points if playing with scores on and the play passes to the next player. At the end of each round, the Outsmarted app lets you know everyone's score and how everyone ranks. Play continues until either one player wins or the set time runs out. When time runs out, the winner is the player with the most points or rings. 
with players having the same number of rings sharing a victory. And that's Outsmarted in a nutshell. If you dig trivia games, you're going to want to pick up Outsmarted. It's that simple. This game perfectly accomplishes what it set it out to do, and that is to be a modern version of the trick-taking games we all grew up with. It's like that game that rhymes with Pivial Tursuit, but fun. <laughs> now, my personal favorite part of the game is the fact you get to choose what categories to play with. No longer are you stuck having to answer questions in a category you know next to nothing about hoping to get lucky. Another bonus of picking categories on an app is that the app keeps track of what questions it's asked before, and you won't get repeat questions, which removes the answer memorization problem that was an aspect of traditional trivia games with some players. Now, if someone else at the table likes obscure Roman architecture, you might still have that category in play, depending on how you choose your categories. But you won't have to put up with the same dreaded categories every single game mm -hmm. if nobody at the table wants them. Now, another big advantage of app-driven questions is that the questions can be catered to the players. This is a trivia game where kids, teens, and adults can all sit down together and play without the adults having an advantage because the app will adjust the questions for age group. Another additional uh, aspect of using apps is you can have things like musical questions, which mm -hmm. are simply impossible in a card-based game of, uh, of trivia. As well, there are regional adaptations. So mm -hmm. questions localized for your player country that you specified during setup. Now, when logging into the app, you select what country you're from, and that actually affects the questions you get, as well as the language the questions are presented in, which is also something you don't get from the old cardboard versions. This was a big deal for me, having grown up as a Canadian playing trivia games that expected me to know things about U.S. politics. Though in Windsor, there is a chance we'd know more about U.S. politics than Canadian. True, very true. Now, the final advantage, I think, for the app is the the questions are all current and updated based on how things change. There's even a current events category that is, uh, I haven't tried this one, but it's supposed to include up-to-date events. Now, this is a big deal for anyone who has played those old classic trivia games and had to answer a question about Czechoslovakia or the USSR. <laughs> now, one issue we did run into, and this is only once in all our plays, and we have played this quite a bit, is an actual wrong answer. Now, this was for a math-based question where they failed to apply Bedmus. And I actually asked if this was a regional thing and if possibly that's not a thing in the region the game was made. Now, the problem was there was no way in the app to accept the correct answer and give the player their points. There's no way to go, we made a mistake, no, give them the points anyway. And I also didn't really see an easy way to report a wrong answer to QPlay. Now, again, we've only seen this once in all our multiple plays. And trust me, the math based, you see them on Facebook or everywhere all the time where it's like, you know, two plus six times two equals. And the some people think you just read it left to right. And other people who took math know you put the times first. So I don't know on that one. So I did manage to find a complicated method of reporting problems uh, on one of the localizations of their websites, but it was painful to find. And I'm not going to expect anyone to go find it. And frankly, it didn't specify anything about problems in the game. So I don't even know if it would have worked if we had used that to report it. Yeah. Now, another thing I do like in this game is the assist system. I just thought it was cool. Like the first time, like having assist is neat, but like the first time that, that they pop up, is really cool too. Like you're like, oh, I get this cool bonus. I thought that was neat. Now, one thing that I didn't mention is when you're setting up the game, you can actually give players additional assists or take them away. So that's another way you can balance player age and skill levels, which is cool. Now, the bonus system I loved. Like the first time I popped, I'm like, oh, cool, it's an app, and I can spin a wheel to see what I get. That's really neat that that's in there. Uh, but then it's it's purely random who gets that, and when it when it comes up. And it just, to me, it would have been way cooler if that was a catch-up mechanic. If the player in last points, the player with the least points every round, had maybe a better chance of getting one of these bonuses to use as a catch-up mechanic. As it is, the player in the lead is just as likely to get a boost as anyone else. 
Now, while there is some fairness in a purely random system, fairness isn't really the ideal goal in this situation. You want to be helping certain players who are perhaps struggling. Now, all of this app-driven play does come with some problems. The biggest one being that this is an app-driven game that happens to have a board that's really only used to track where everyone is. While the game can be played with one device, and it even comes with a stand to hold your device, you're not going to want to play with the device at the top of the board like they show in all the pictures. Like, for one, how like is one person going to answer the answers or everyone's going to lean over the board and tap it? Um, you're going to end up passing this around. And if you're passing it around, only one person can see what's going on. So you're basically saying they're doing nothing while another player is playing with the thing. Um, if you are stuck doing this, I would recommend having a tablet at least, maybe having one player that enters all the, like almost plays like the host to enter the questions, or maybe run the Steam version on a PC monitor big enough that everyone can see it. Because despite being designed as a one device game, this just plays so much better if everyone at the table has their own device. And everyone but the game owner joins in. Though this does lead to a group of people sitting around a table, staring at their phones and not interacting, especially in the timed modes where you're just trying to rush ahead. Yeah, that part is true. Now, one advantage of going digital, though, is the ability to play remotely. This could mean all the players, each on their own device, located anywhere in the world, or it could be a mix. It could be me sitting with Deanna, Kat, and Tori, and Sean playing remotely, which I do think is really cool. Now, the app does include a digital die roller and a, a graphic representation of the board for the remote player and in app chat so everyone can talk to each other. The problem with this, though, is manipulating the digital board on the app. On a small device, it is rather difficult to get your pawn onto the right square. You'd be fine on a tablet, but you will have difficulty mm -hmm. on a phone. It's almost easier to just have the players actually in front of the board move your piece for you and give you your options after each roll. Even zooming in on the phone wasn't enough to help with pawn placement as they, they cut off the zoom at a certain point. You couldn't, you know, zoom infinite. So overall, I found a lot to like and outsmarted. This is an improved and modernized version of traditional trivia-based board games. Having played this, I can't see playing any of the classics ever again. Now, there is one thing this game didn't change from those old games is the fact it's a trivia game, and not everyone likes trivia, myself being one of those people. Though for a trivia game, this is the best I've played. It's just not the kind of game I'm going to rush out and look to play on my own. But I will say, if a group comes over and is like, hey, let's play some Outsmarted, sure, I'll play a round of Outsmarted. I'll insist we do a timed game, not a full game. And I'll probably ask to play something else when we're done. On the other hand, I'll happily play this pretty much any time. Uh, the fact that you can customize the categories, put this one over the top for me. As I like trivia, but like many geeks, my trivia knowledge is somewhat niche and not always suitable for the sorts of general knowledge other trivia games mm -hmm. rely on. If you aren't really a trivia game fan, this game probably won't win you over. Now, that said, if what you don't like about trivia games are the limited categories, the out-of-date questions, and spending forever trying to land on the right spot, maybe you should give out try, Outsmarted a try, because those issues have been addressed in rather smart ways. Like me, you might also really learn to love this game, now, only if I can find more folks to play with who also like it. Hey, if you've got a copy, you can play remotely with Sean now. Now, if you are a trivia fan, I've already basically said this, and you've had fond memories of collecting pie pieces and reading questions off cards, just pick this one up. You're going to dig it. Now, Outsmarted takes the tried and true classic gameplay of classic trivia board games and modernizes it and improves on it in so many ways. Now, if you are thinking of grabbing this game, there's no better time than now. I'm going to stay on all sales mini here for a minute. Because right now, Qplay has outsmarted Markdown 30% off. And you can use our exclusive code, Bellhop, B-E-L-L-H-O-B, -L -L to save another 10% off on top of that. Link in the show notes as usual. Well, that's it for our review of Outsmarted, a modern update to classic trivia-based board games. A burst of nostalgia for both of us, but also a reimagining of the genre that fixes many of the problems the original games it's based on had. 
Now, if you want to learn more about Outsmarted, you'll be able to check out my written review over on the blog, where I'll be able to go into a little more detail than we had time for here, as well as providing many of pictures from our gameplays. Do you enjoy trivia games? What's your favorite? Is it the classic Trivial Pursuit or something else? Tell us about it in the comments below. It's time to take a look at another puzzle box. It's time the Orbital Box Times 2, a rather unique puzzle in two parts from Escape Welt, who we have, who we have to thank for sending us a copy of this. I also have to thank them for an exclusive 10% off discount code BELLHOP, B-E-L-L-H-O-P, which I encourage you to use if this review gets you interested in their puzzles. Now, we've talked about a number of Escape Welt's puzzles on the show before. Um, these include the House of the Dragon, the Fort Knox box, um, the Space Box, and the Quest Pyramid. These puzzles are a little different from what we're looking at today. This adds a whole new level to the experience. The Orbital Box times two really is two puzzles at once, thus the times two. The thing with this puzzle is that you have to build it first in order to solve it. That's right. Here you not only get a nice assembled box that you have to solve to get inside. No, you actually have to build that box. For a look at how the Orbital Box Times 2 comes packaged, check out our unboxing video over on YouTube and learn that it's not two Orbital Boxes. It's one, one puzzle that's solved yep. in two ways. I wasn't sure when it said Orbital Box Times 2. That might have meant I'm getting two boxes to give to people. Um, there what you will see is you'll a bunch of laser cut birchwood sheets and a rather thick set of instructions. Um, there's also a small baggie in there that has a small sheet of sandpaper and in it, a disc of wax. Now I thought that was a pulley when I was doing the unboxing because of the shape of it. Well, it is a ball of wax. This is important because I spent an hour or so scouring our house, looking for a candle because the instructions said I needed wax. And there it was right in the box. Now that I know you ended up streaming, streaming your build of this wooden puzzle box over on our Twitch channel, and we'll be releasing a copy of that on YouTube once it's done edited, getting edited. But how about you talk about how the build went here for people who didn't get to see that live? So I have to say, I was extremely impressed just by how well everything fit and went together. The instructions, while printed in something like 12 different languages, were actually quite clear. The step-by-step -step images were all language independent and just featured little symbols like take care here, or wax this part, or sand this before assembly, and actually gave me some flashbacks to building Robotech model kits. Now, most impressive, though, was how easily the various parts pop out of the wooden frames and then fit together. Now, they did give you a tool for doing this, this kind of like poker tool, and it was great. Like, if you do open one of these, don't try to do it on your own. Use the tool. Now, I did have a hobby knife on hand, and I think I used it twice, maybe three times for the entire build, which is pretty good. Now, another nice thing I saw is that Escape Welt included some backup parts mm -hmm. for some of the more breakable pieces. Now, did you have to use any of those? One. One. Though I admit I spent the entire build worried I was going to break something that didn't have a replacement part. But that didn't happen. All right. Well, how long did the build take? I'd, so I didn't time it. I should have, like, I, especially I was on a live stream. I should have threw a timer up right on the screen, but I didn't even think of it. So the entire screen stream that I did was about two hours, but I know a bunch of that was like me setting things up and getting our backdrop ready and putting our logos up and waiting for people to show up after the go live notification went out and interacting with the chat. Cause we actually had a, a surprisingly active chat room for that build, which was awesome. As for the actual build time, I would say between an hour and an hour and a half, uh, maybe closer to an hour 15. Now, one thing I will say that made that quick, though, when compared to building other things, I wooden things I built like box sensors for board games, is this requires zero glue, no glue required at all, which, as far as timing is concerned, means no waiting for glue to dry. And no having to smooth out over glue or use toothpicks to get glue into corners. That's yeah. a big bonus. Uh, overall, I really enjoyed building this box. It, it was a good mix of stressful because you, you don't want to break anything too incredibly relaxing. 
Now, I personally always found building models, making scenery, painting miniatures, building box inserts to be a very relaxing experience as long as nothing goes wrong. And well, nothing really went wrong during the build. And that is one thing, thing people should know. You have done a lot of miniature painting and scenery assemble as well as box inserts and other things. So you're not exactly a rookie at assembling this sort of thing, even if this particular style was a new one. Very true. I would say even just as a 3D puzzle experience, I enjoyed building the, 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 the orbital box. Like it was a fun experience just to build this box. What I loved was seeing the inner workings of one of these escape well puzzles. And, and they blow me away by the engineering that goes into putting one of these things together. Um, in particular, in this puzzle was the way they assembled a combination lock and just the number of different wooden pieces that went into building these dials you had to turn. And the final result was very satisfying. I had this chunky, solid puzzle that felt great to hold especially after seeing it as a bunch of flat pieces of wood and potential sitting waiting to be built. So one of the big questions we both had before you even started building the orbital box was how could you not end up knowing the solution while building the puzzle? So this is interesting, and I, I think there's a little bit of misleading information on the box itself. So the box promises you you're getting two games in one. You're getting a 3D puzzle then a finished wooden puzzle box to open. And while that's kind of true, see, when you finish the build, you've done all the steps in the instruction book, you've got the box in front of you, but it's open and unlocked. Escape well in the rules then challenges you to figure out how to actually lock the box. So there was a puzzle to solve at the end, even though I was the one to build the puzzle. So there was a puzzle part aspect of this. So that was neat. There was a puzzle, but the puzzle wasn't getting it open. It was locking it closed, which is just a little different than what they were saying. Now, that said, once you do figure that out, you will know how to reopen the box. But you're going to know how to mechanically open the box, not the logic of the puzzle. So, for example, I mentioned a combination lock. Well, I knew what position the locks had to be in, but I didn't know. What on the box told me to put them that way? I only knew because I was the one that put the dials there. Now, this is certainly an interesting concept, but it may limit the market for who's going to buy this. A solo puzzle, lo puzzle lover might not want this unless they're going to keep it around for some time when they need to gift it to another puzzle solver. Yeah, only having to figure out how to lock things did also cause a bit of a problem. Well, I knew how to open it. I was the only one. So I handed the puzzle over to Deanna and she was stumped for quite some time. Eventually, I took the puzzle back and went, well, I know how to open it, but let's let's reverse engineer it. Look, going backwards, let's figure out how someone who didn't know how to open it is supposed to get the proper solution. And I figured out there was no way. Something seemed to be wrong. Oopsie, not a good sign. So after much fiddling and checking how other people solved the box online and watching a number of YouTube channels and puzzle solvers try to figure this puzzle out, I realized I had assembled two parts of the puzzle wrong. Now, one was an entire sidewall of the puzzle that was upside down. Thankfully, this was pretty easy to fix. Due to the fact you don't glue anything, I just had to unsnap a couple tabs and then I could swap the wall. Now, this one was 100% my fault. After looking at the instructions, I see how things should have been. Now, that said, I'm surprised Escape Welt didn't account for this because it would have been really easy to add a pokey yoke. A pokey yoke is a physical change to a piece, so it only goes together one way. And all they had to do was offset one of the tabs two millimeters, and then it wouldn't fit in both ways, but they didn't. So that's one improvement I would love to see. If you're listening to Escape Welt, just, you know, make it so that the tabs aren't exactly the same on the top and bottom of your pieces. Of course, it's quite possible they didn't realize that it was possible to mix that up and wouldn't have known to put it in a fail safe as a result. Yeah, true enough. Now, the other problem, I, I take full responsibility for not paying enough attention to the instructions. I will say the top and the bottom of this, and they flip it a bunch in the instructions is what confused me. I think I had it upside down when I put that wall on. That was on me. The other one, though, is 100% on escape hook. There is a square piece, a square-shaped piece that is meant to slide around on one side of the puzzle. 
The instructions show you putting this in place rotated 90 degrees from what it should be. Now, I double checked this on multiple videos and even Escape Welt's own solution page. And by assembling this side of the puzzle as shown in the book, you can't solve the puzzle logically, which is a disappointment. Yeah, that's unfortunate. And not the first mistake we've known about in their puzzles, though they have fixed the other issues uh, that have been discovered. Now, unfortunately, that problem kind of sours the whole experience. Well, I loved building this puzzle, and I thought the end result was awesome looking. It also has an awesome prize space, the, the spot you open, um, and, and it has the most room to become an awesome gift box. But the fact they tell you to build it wrong in the instructions is a big deal. Now, I was able to fix that side as well, though I will say this was a narrow side and it didn't come off nearly as easy as the other. I was able to get that uh, square out and rotate it appropriately. And now that it's fixed, the puzzle's awesome. When assembled correctly, I would say this is the easiest of Escape Welt's puzzles and quick to solve for your average person. Like once fixed, Deanna managed to get it in maybe 10 minutes. Well, that's a relief given how nonsensical it was before those errors were discovered. Now, for anyone that picks this up, just know that on the sliding square, the little rocket triangle shaped thing in the square goes in the top right and the circle with the X through it goes in the opposite corner, bottom left. And that's not really a spoiler. It does nothing to help uh, much to help those trying to decipher it, just those building it. Yeah. So overall, I really loved building the orbital box times two. It went together very well, and the resulting puzzle box is very cool. It's one of the nicest looking boxes they have, and it looks like a gift box. It's a nice big box that can hold some pretty large items, which is a nice change to the other escape boat puzzles and their tiny little compartments. We have complained in the past about the small interior size, and this definitely makes up for it. This is a mm -hmm. real large chest styled box that can hold something about the size you'd expect when you look at the box, not something a fraction of that size as with some other puzzles. Now, if you know someone who's into 3D puzzles, I don't think you can go wrong picking them up a copy of the Orbital Box Times 2. It's an enjoyable build. Just make sure to point them to this review or let them know about the one error in the rule book. Now, if you enjoy these kind of puzzles yourself, you're going to dig this one. And well, you already know about the one issue you need to watch out for. Now, if you don't like the assembly process, you might want to pass or perhaps buy it for someone else to assemble on your behalf so that you get the joy of solving it, but not the stress of building it. Very true. Now, the other thing you can do is you can just buy the orbital box. This is the orbital box times two. You can buy the puzzle as a standalone puzzle, um, as well as the two-part build and solve version we're talking about today. So you can do it. Interestingly, they're now also doing this with the Fort Knox box, which we've reviewed in the past. You can now buy a build-your-own Fort Knox box puzzle, just like this is the build-your-own um, orbital box. And they call the Fort Knox one the Fort Knox box pro. Now, one thing I did notice when doing a bit of research on that, because I know I had seen it, was these are cheaper. So the build yourself versions are cheaper than the completed boxes, which is nice to see. And honestly, makes sense because they didn't have to pay someone else to assemble it before shipping it to you. For only pennies a day, though, you could help some poor German family pay you for their dinner by assembling Escape Welt's boxes. I have no idea who builds the boxes for Escape Welt. Just saying. No, I do not either. <laughs> well, I did in this case. Uh, personally, I think your average puzzle fan is going to want to pick this up, build it, and then use it as a gift box to someone else. And it, just like all of the escape out boxes, I think that's the most fun part of these is once you solve them, putting a gift inside and giving them to someone else. Now, in this case, the recipient doesn't get the fun of building the box, but they have the fun of solving it. And honestly, this one shouldn't be too frustrating. This is definitely the easiest to open box from escape out we've tried so far. Either way, though, if you do end up picking up an orbital box times two or any of the other puzzles, just the full orbital box, if you're buying it for yourself or someone else, remember, use our code BELLHOP to save 10% off, which stacks with any existing deals. Well, that's it for our look at the orbital box times two from Escape Welt, a two-in-one puzzle experience that leaves you with a very cool gift box at the end. Now, if you're interested in seeing just how this gift box goes together, Watch for my Orbital Box build-in review to be live on YouTube in the coming weeks. 
Well, that's our last review for tonight. Have you tried these games or built an orbital box yourself? We'd love to hear about it on any on our Discord, which you can find at discord.com slash no at discord. It was right this time. Dot com. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. So first one I have is Aurum. This is a brand new game um, hitting store shelves in August from Pandasaurus Games, who we have to thank for getting us an early release copy. This is a trick-taking game. So unlike uh, being confused and disappointed by Trick Draw, I got exactly what I expected here. This is a traditional two a uh, four player two team trick taking game with the ability to also play three players the big change here from traditional trick taking is that when the 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 lead is played you cannot follow suit in addition you can't play any suit that's already been played into a trick and man um i messed it up the most <laughs> deanna messed it up at least once Sean didn't but man i found that hard to do like you see someone throw a blue and you just want to throw another blue. Like it just a yep. years of playing trick taking games that's ingrained into my brain that I have to follow suit. Yeah, no, it's definitely uh, an easy mistake to make. I was, I was focusing rather d- deeply to make sure I didn't <laughs> make that mistake. I, I think this, the game has some really solid, solid play ideas. Uh, and once you get over that one major difference mm-hmm. and can and can get your brain working while uh correctly i think it's a fun game unfortunately we played it only so far at three player and this is very much a two-team trick yeah. playing game uh like euchre uh and they had to make some adjustments for the three player which just wasn't ideal i think yeah i agree i i, I we i have now talked to the uh designer of this game and it ends up there is already an errata up on board game geek so the game isn't even store shelves and are already having to errata the first printing which is all i I feel sorry for pandasaurus for that that something got through that shouldn't have which improves the three-player game but still i I don't have much interest in trying this again three players now other little things it adds is you are bidding on how many tricks kind of like spades so that's nice but it's actually like an area control game in the end because you're going to get points for the gold cards you have And if you hit your bid or beat your bid or you double your bid, if you hit it, whoever has the most points wins the round and takes a gold. So there's like a neat point based thing. And then the player, well, when playing three players, I guess it's supposed to be first player to two gold that wins the overall game. But when playing uh, partners, there's a different system, which we haven't tried yet. There's some interesting stuff here where the lowest played card in a trick gets to take a gold card of the same value. So when you're not winning a trick, you still want to play as high a card as possible to get the right gold cards. Gold cards are worth more points, but they go in a pool. But you can also pull from that pool to win tricks. There's a lot of neat things going on in this game. Yeah, and as as well, you can change your bid uh, throughout the game. Uh, Again, I think, one again, once you get your brain to shift gears into the can't follow suit, Mm -hmm. the flow of the game is actually pretty natural. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think it's going to be a really good team, uh, two team game. Uh, it just doesn't shine at, at its fullest at three player. Yeah, I agree. Next up, Castle Panic. Uh, again, we played the base game and we finally won. I, I was shocked. Uh, I don't I still don't understand why we find Castle Panic so difficult. And the rest of the world seems to think it's the easiest co-op out there. But whatever it was, we finally won. Uh, fairly handily so we went all right we're done with the base game we are now going to try out the wizard's tower i dig the wizard's tower the the big thing it adds is a a wizard's tower replaces one of the things and you get a deck of wizard spells that this wizard helps you out and man they're all awesome like they almost seem overpowered then you also really mess with the the monster bag what what comes up including like imps that can be summoned and boss monsters there's like six different like badass boss monsters that could come out and you only use three each game and it just it was neat i i really liked the feel of this it it somehow felt completely fresh and more interesting than the base game yeah it's it's still while it's still a very random game uh this felt much more like a hobby game as opposed to a generic you know mass market totally random uh game 
Now, I think we also learned some better techniques in this in the yeah. in the game we won. Uh, there were certain things we had we had been trying to overthink the game. I think, I think so. was part of the problem. Uh, we were trying to plan for future turns when the randomness of the game doesn't allow for that, and you just need to do the maximum you can every single turn in that base game. Whereas mm -hmm. you do start to get more strategy in the Wizard's Tower because of especially the the Wizard cards. Yep. Now I will say we did terrible. Um, because our wizard tower fell first out of all the towers. And then we spent the game without those awesome wizard spells and well, terrible boss monsters that just kicked our butts. But it was still, I, I had more fun playing that lose early game of wizards tower than I think I had any of the games of Passle Planet before. Yep. Uh, next up, we played a round of birds of a feather. Now we did talk about this one at the end of our origins wrap up. And we talked about it during the origins wrap up. Uh, this is the game where you're playing bird cards and each has a habitat. You then, when you play your cards, see all the other birds that were played at the same habitat. They stick around for one turn. So you can kind of catch the ones that are lingering. Still dig this game. It is super light. Like this is, I basically just taught you how to play in a way. Um, yeah, there's some rarities and things to worry about. Um, it does. There is a free app out there. So if anyone wants to try Birds of a Feather, you can get the free Birds of the Feather app. Now, all it does allow is solo play, but it also works as a scorecard for the game, which is mainly why we opened it. So after we finished our game, we actually each tried it solo, which I got to say was a little different, but worked pretty well. What I was impressed by in the solo mode that's not, or sorry, on the solo app that's not in the, um, Card game is lots more information about each of the birds. So that was cool to see. If you clicked on and tapped whatever on any of the birds, you actually got like a full uh, description of what more information on the bird. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, but as Dan is pointing out in the chat, though, the free solo version is very different than the multiplayer game. It's it's a different way to play. Mm -hmm. And the one thing we did notice is the rule book has a like, you know, this is a you, you can get ranked like, you know, you're an average bird watcher or whatever. We're horrible. All of us are terrible. I, and I'm either missing something or I am especially bad at it because I have come in dead last uh, yeah. at, at all plays of it so far. I, I don't know. Yeah. And I, I don't know what you're doing different than what I'm doing. So I think I've won every play so far. So it's mm -hmm. one that for whatever my brain clicks in well, or I'm good at choosing which birds to play. I don't know what it is. Still digging the game. Um, we may review this next week. I don't know. I don't know how many how many reviews we're going to fit in. It's it's a nice quick one. I, I got to say for for super. I'm not usually into super light games, but there's something about that one. Maybe it's just the the Zen look at the pretty birds feel of it that like I don't feel overly competitive playing it. I dig it. All right. Next, we finally Mark, you're welcome. We finally played our first holiday hijinks game. Now, holiday hijinks games come from Grand Gamers Guild. These are small package escape room in a box style games that are made with only 18 cards. Uh, going back to the original 18 card challenge where Hanabi comes from. The one we played is the Independence Incident because it was the weekend between Canada Day and the 4th of July. So I thought it would fit. They are the, all of these different um, holiday hijinks games are based on holidays. Well, I assuming you consider your birthday a holiday. Now, I expected this to be very American, being a 4th of July game about Independence Day. I wasn't expecting quite how American it would be and how much American history, geography you would need to know. Now, thankfully, the app, which I'm saying app, but really it just it's a QR code that goes to a web page, has all of the info you need and more. So that was impressive. Like you could go there and it's got a list of the founding fathers. It's got a list of all the presidents. It's got a copy of the Declaration of Independence, or at least the beginning of it. It's got a copy of American folk songs. So all of the information is there. But I think Americans are going to get more out of this than we did. Now, we got 4.5 out of 5 stars, which I think is pretty good for a bunch of Canadians. Well, I look forward to uh, hearing about the uh, the first of these holiday hijinks in uh, in the upcoming review. Uh, we've got a bunch of these to get through, and they are um, I don't know what you can you do you call them escape rooms or are they just puzzle games? What are 
I, they call them escape room in a box. Like, like they're in, they're, they're there with the exit games or anything. Um, one thing I was going to mention more in the full review is nothing destroyed. I could happily give you your, my copy of the independence incident and you can play through it. Um, that, it was, it was the same type. It was puzzles. Um, there wasn't like a mystery. Uh, technically there was a mystery of all, but it was, it was, a, it was a series of puzzles presented one at a time. Some used one card, some used multiple cards. All right. Now we wrapped up the weekend with our first six player game of Castle Panic. At this point, like I said, we kind of put the base game aside. We are playing just with the Wizard's Tower. Uh, props to the Castle Panic big box for basically giving me a way to leave it set up to play Wizard's Tower. So that was nice. Broke it out. I already had the bag, had the right things in it. Um, I I don't know why I thought this, but and I'm wrong. I thought six was going to be easier. So six players, what I thought would make it easier is the fact you can trade two cards a turn instead of one, which I thought would make it way easier to get what you needed on your turn. The problem is players only get four cards each. And what we found is as no one had cards after their first turn, there was no one to trade with. So that extra trade didn't help. And even when you could trade, players' hands were so much smaller that they didn't have anything to give up. Now, the game we played went bad but it was odd because we only got around the table once so out of six players four people only got to take one turn two people got to go twice now this should be a bad thing but no one playing but deanna i uh, actually seemed to care about this <laughs> like we were all laughing and having fun and 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 like the last round that took out three of our towers in one set of draws from the bag was pretty amusing and if the trebuchet had just targeted a different tower, it would have taken out the phoenix that was took us out, and we would have got one more turn. I, I, we all loved it. Um, this was the first time my youngest played, and she really enjoyed it. We even got a uh, Holly to join us, which is awesome. Haven't had to, gotten a game with Holly in a long time. Uh, Brenda seemed to enjoy the game. Like the extended family seemed to really enjoy this game. Now, I know Deanna still not a big fan, but I do think. He likes it better with the Wizard's Tower. And we've got so many more uh, expansions to try as well. And, and I, I agree. Like, I, I'm, I'm with Dee on this one. The, the addition of the Wizard's Tower has really brought this into a gamer's level uh, where yeah. it just wasn't before. Yeah, where Dan is saying this was fine. It was one of those games where the group made the game, especially our kids' enthusiasm, feeding off of that. And I told, I get it. It's, it's not a game for Deanna. All right. Well, how about a look ahead? Uh, what, are, what do you have coming up? So going strong on unboxings. We're nice and ahead of schedule on that. Um, I, you can't wait till the new ones start coming out because they're recorded here in the new studio. I've now got a three camera setup and um, higher definition. We will now be broadcasting uh, the, the unboxings. We'll be at higher video quality, which some people have asked for. So looking forward to those getting out. Um, the big thing still is, yes, it, it is awesome that we went to Origins and it's awesome we brought a bunch of games back, but we do still have a pile of obligation that existed beforehand. So we're still trying to push through that before we get into a lot of Origins stuff. Now, the big one this week and or two, like the next couple of weeks, is going to be trying out the latest Martin Wallace game. This is Fighting Fantasy Adventures. This is based on the Fighting Fantasy game books, the classic game books from Ian Livingston and Steve Jackson that many of us hobby gamers grew up playing. This looks great. This is a card-driven, dungeon-crawling game by Martin Wallace. I'm really looking forward to checking that out. All right. Uh, anything else? Well, then on the pile of obligation, there is more Castle Panic. Um, I kind of feel like I want to do Wizards Tower till I win before opening the next one, but we'll see how many games that takes. I'm also hoping to get a literati to the table. That's one I want Brenda to be able to try because she's one of the people really into spelling games. I think Gwen will enjoy it as well. So I'm hoping to try that with the extended family. Um, the one I want to play with you when you're available is Seas of Havoc because Seas of Havoc is a combination of naval battle game, worker placement game, and deck builder. And it takes the whole you're mashing deck building with board game to a whole new level, in my opinion. It's like it's step even above Tyrants of the Underdark for integrating those different mechanics. 
And I think we're going to have a lot of fun with that one. Plus, for our last unboxings, what I did is I let the kids each pick one game from something we brought back from Origins that they want to play. And while despite the fact we won't be reviewing them right away, we do have to play the game a bunch of times before we can talk about it. So there are a couple Origins games that I am hoping to play with the kids. All righty. And this show wouldn't be possible without our Patreon patrons, our VIP guests. So here's a quick shout out to five of them. Roger Malosh of Roger Dodger Games. Thank you. David Miller Jr. Thank you. Brian Kurtz. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Jeff, Sheila, and Clara Seuss. Thank you. Kat Tory and now Clark Dome. I don't know if we can do with Kator anymore. Kate. Tor Club, uh, I don't know. Like Kator, like I, I don't hey, know. Hey Torque, hey Torque. That that sounds rude somehow. <laughs> it really does. Clay Tark, Clay Tark, maybe. There we go. That sounds somehow better than Clay Tark. <laughs> anyway, what I, what I want to know if you're listening at home right now, or if you're listening, when can we game together? My kiddo's got to be old enough for a babysitter by now. Well, that was the double bell. That means our shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the lobby doors. So, the doors are closed. You can always find us at TabletopBellhop.com, all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice as the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. Dig the show and the other content we produce? Please consider stopping by Patreon.com slash Tabletop Bellhop and tip your bellhop. Well, that's all for tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us live, and be sure to stick around for the Penthouse Suite After Show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And And game game on. on.